I'm Joel Cohen, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to this discussion on Occupy. I'm joined by a, a great panel of speakers. To my immediate left is uh, Reverend George Pitcher, who's a journalist and Anglican priest at St. Bride's Church in Fleet Street. Um, he's also author of a book called The Death of Spin, and, and before becoming a priest, did uh, some work in PR and the relative fields. Next to him is Ian Chamberlain, who's a, a writer and human rights campaigner and uh, an activist of the Occupy movement who, who camped out in London Stock Exchange. Sitting on the far side there is Natalie Fenton, who's co-head of the department of the Leverhulme Media Research Centre at Goldsmiths University in London. Um, she's also editor of a, a collection of essays called uh, New Media, Old News, Journalism and Democracy in a Digital Age. And then finally, we have uh, Brendan O'Neill, the editor of Spiked and author of Can I Recycle My Granny and 39 Other Eco Dilemmas. And finally, uh, sitting next to me, the co-producer of this session, Nikos Sotirakopoulos, yes. thank you, um, who's a PhD student at uh, the University of Kent in Canterbury, um, studying sociology, and who did a lot of field work in the climate camps and, and Occupy movement in the creation of his PhD thesis. I'd like to start by asking Ian Chamberlain. The Occupy movement was a, a first massive intervention of prefigurative politics, that is, a politics which tries to envision the kind of society um, it aims to achieve in its political intervention. Uh, do you think that Occupy has left prefigurative politics as a new means of activism or, or one that certainly is going to be a hard act to follow? Or do you think it served its purpose and now um, is no longer so useful to the movement? Yeah. Well, I, I think it was prefigurative in, in this respect, in that, it, that unlike a lot of um, sort of traditional um, political movements, it was a genuinely open space. Um, I think people in society who maybe shared our frustrations um, maybe didn't feel engaged with trades unions, with political parties, etc. There was a real sense of disillusionment. And I think certainly it, within the first two months of Occupy, there was a genuine openness for, to have a debate, um, to discover what our sort of common grievances were, and to start discussing um, ways in which we might tackle these common grievances. I, I think few people thought the sort of prefigurative side of things was you know, if we stay here long enough, everyone will form similar communities and this will be the new society. I don't think it was prefigurative in that sense. It, it, was, it was open and debate was encouraged. Various different speakers were invited to come down and speak to us. And I, I genuinely believe that it engaged with people outside of existing sort of political um, processes, whether it be, as I say, political parties, trade unions. And I, I was quite frustrated often how the media depicted us simply as, you know, homeless people, or the next day it would be sort of middle class students, or the next day it would be people with drugs and alcohol problems. You know, actually each day we were sort of stereotyped, and actually they described everyone after sort of about six months. It was genuinely diverse, like no other political movement or organization I'd been involved in. Um, it wasn't just students. Um, it wasn't just traditional sort of leftists from the SWP or from similar leftist groups. It was genuinely open. So I think the sort of legacy, I mean, talking about a legacy sounds like something has ended and, you know, where are we now sort of thing. Um, I think what we've been left with post-eviction, uh, when St. Paul's was, um, when the camp came to an end, um, genuine networks of affiliation um, a consensus around some of the problems in our society and those relationships w that were formed in that physical space at St Paul's are very much active today um, and maybe later I'll talk about ways in which they're developing. Okay. Thank you and then can I sort of throw an aspect of what Ian said to Natalie saying at the end there. In what sense do you think the representation of Occupy within the wider media presented Occupy as a force that it kind of wasn't in the sense that the media often talk about it as a, a protest movement that was engaged in envisioning a genuine and progressive alternative to the state of capitalism and the world that is today rather than kind of what Ian was saying of just a, a bunch of people questioning, a diverse group of people questioning and interrogating the world. In what sense was it a, a media invention in, in that respect? Oh, well, 
I'd, I'm not sure I agree with the view that it was all presented negatively. Actually, if you look at protest movements over the ages, Occupy did quite well in its media representation. And it, it was presented it, partly because it had a, a mood of the public behind it to a large extent. It was presented in, in quite a positive way. There were always moments where it was going to be, you know, your usual stereotypes would be trotted out. Uh, that will always be the case, but it didn't do too badly in mainstream media. And part of the reason for that was it, it was actually incredibly savvy in the way it handled the media and it, it worked very hard as a group as an organization to make sure that it was talking to the mainstream media all the time. So it was, it, it handled that well, and it's still handling the media, I think, pretty well, and has a very good understanding of how to get good media attention, hence the um, stunt in St. Paul's last weekend, which got a lot of, actually, again, quite positive media coverage. In what way do you think Occupy is in, has been clear about it? Um, sense of what it was doing and the intervention it was trying to make in society or, or do you think in some way that um, you know the Occupy movement has been misrepresented and its agenda misrepresented in um, the way that it's been discussed in, in modern politics? I think it did quite well in concerning its, its appeal in the media but there is an explanation for that. When there is a movement that has no actual and definite narrative, everyone can project his own narrative on the movement. So maybe I have a completely different agenda on you, and we're both in, the, in St. Paul's, and we think that what we're actually doing is projecting our agenda in the media. But I think that this is very problematic for a movement, because a, a movement lacking a, a clear vision about itself, then it becomes very easy for, uh, for the press to say it's a movement of alcoholics or of homeless people. But the reason why this happened is not only because people in the press are nasty, probably this is also true, but it was too easy for them because there was a complete absence of a political character of the movement saying we are for this, we stand for this, so this is who we are. Okay. And then can I throw that to George? Would you say that Occupy did have a clear position in that, um, from your perspective and the perspective of the Anglican Church were you know, it's embroiled in a lot of the discussion around Occupy both in the St. Paul's camp and more lasting sense? You know, do you think Occupy had, had a clear agenda and, and why do you think the church has um, made moves towards, um, you know, courting or has had a severe debate amongst itself about um, how it should treat the Occupy movement? I don't think Occupy had a clear agenda, but I think that's something to be celebrated. I'm not sure protest movements have ever really had a very clear agenda and I'm not aware in 1749 or whenever it was that the the Bastille was being stormed in France and people were shouting liberté, fraternité, galité. I wasn't conscious that people, journalists from right-wing papers at the time, were stopping people and going, yeah, but could you tell us what you mean by egalité? You know, have you really got your uh, policies straightened out here? So um, I think they were, it's Occupy uh, represented uh, a very broad feeling in our society. And by broad, I mean it broached Middle England as well. There are plenty of people that would normally, I mean, you know, previous protest movements, they've talked patronizingly about crusties with dogs on strings, you know. But a lot of Middle England was going, well, you know, these people have got a point. The bankers have run off with the money and they're making these people pay and they're making us pay. And I'm not sure we like that. Um, so I'm not sure actually a protest movement needs to have a manifesto that's, uh, that's deconstructible. And I, you know, we're, we in the church are um, doing much the same thing. We're just raising questions like, do you know, don't you think it could be a lot better than this? Don't you think we could do better than this? And I'm not sure a protest movement or a church needs a greater manifesto than that. So I think it's really refreshing that there are people that are able to go, look, we don't necessarily have all the answers, but boy, do we have some serious questions. And on that, I would say that, you know, I'm with the sort of liberation theology, or some of the liberation theology movement from South America. I, I think it was the archbishop of, an archbishop in Brazil who said, um, when I give money to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why they're poor, they call me a communist. You know, so in a sense, uh, the church isn't going to win that one. But if we are meant to be standing in the corner with the vulnerable and the marginalised, we sure could do a lot better than we did last year with Occupy. Great. And then finally, I'd like to sort of throw that to Brendan before we have a, a, a more open discussion amongst the panel. 
you know, why is it that we're still talking about the Occupy movement today? And isn't there a sense, as George said, that um, there is an aspect where Occupy envisions our sense of uh, our, our contemporary attitude towards wanting to, to change society for the better that's still um, you know, relevant to the way we talk about politics today? For me, the most striking thing about Occupy when I visited the one at St. Paul's was actually how little they talked about change at all and certainly how little program they had in, in way of a kind of program uh, uh, promoting change. And I think that's because Occupy was, in essence, a very conservative identity movement. It was, it was, it was really about the politics of identity. It was about carving out a public persona for yourself as someone who is not part of the rat race, as someone who is quite sensitive to the trappings of the market, who is able to resist advertising and all those other things. I think it was very much a theatrical display of one's own kind of superior cultural sensitivities. And that's why I think it went on and on and on forever. You know, people said, why doesn't it have an end point? What, what are its goals? But the reason it was kind of so interminable is because it was effectively a performative theatrical display of a kind of identity. You know, you could see it in the clothes they wore, in the food they ate, it was always this kind of organic food, in the way in which they disposed of their food, all this kind of recycling. Uh, it, was, it was a public statement of their ability to not be like the rest of us. That's what it was. So I think I completely disagree with the other speakers who have said that it tapped into a public mood. I think it, was, it really went against a public mood, self-consciously. It self-consciously juxtaposed itself to this idea that the rest of us are all kind of brainwashed by the media and by the market. And that's why I think there was such important international virtual link-ups between the different occupiers, because these were tiny cliques who felt isolated within their own societies, and therefore they're forced to kind of make these virtual bonds across the world to other tiny cliques as a kind of way of overcoming their isolation. Okay. Ian, do you want to come back yeah. on that? I, I, I'm sort of very critical of forms of lifestyle politics in the way that Brendan is. Um, but I, I genuinely don't believe that was what was Occupy was about because we, I, th I think what we did in, you know, in the first few weeks is we really found areas of consensus on the issues like, you know, actually the, the public were totally with us on the issue of growing inequality. You know, this is the, abs if you look at all the polling data on this, absolutely uniformly, um, this is a problem for everyone. Everyone is talking about this. Um, I, I, I think the very nature of an occupation, maybe the perception is of, sort of, um, of a sort of lifestyle politics, but we were talking about some very practical solutions to uh, growing inequality, the austerity measures of the government. Um, I think we should also be aware of the limitations of Occupy, and I'm certainly aware of these. But I, I think the way Occupy worked for a lot of people, as I said earlier, people who weren't engaged or were disillusioned came along and actually learnt about, learnt about a, political, a radical political tradition. Um, I think the left is very poor at um, sort of passing on to the next generation um, the, the sort of institutional wisdom of how the left organizes and wins struggles and, you know, builds a better society. So there's often a lot of reinventing that goes on for each um, generation. But actually within Occupy, I think we started to hear from people who had learned those lessons, benefited from that knowledge, and, and I think started to talk about ways in which members of Occupy would, say, engage with the trades union movement, with political parties, with forms of nonviolent direct action, and genuinely interested in building a movement because there are lots of good ideas out there about how we can build a fairer society, but there's no political impetus to do so because um, there's no cohesive force. It interested me that within two weeks of being there, people were saying, well, where is this mass movement? You know, I think if you look at the civil rights movement, years and years and years of work of building, uh, organizing, educating, building relationships. This doesn't happen in two weeks. It doesn't happen in one year. Yes, we are on the back foot vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of uh, defending public services or, def or building a fairer, uh, more equal society. We are on the back foot because we're disorganized. Um, but I think we're seeing the start of building something here.
I'd just like to add to that, if I may, that um, Brendan speaks about um, identity politics and a theatrical event as if it's something bad. I say, hallelujah, you know. Um, uh, isn't it great that people have such a proud and uh, self-possessed sense of their own identity that they say, uh, this isn't for me, things can be better than this. It seems to me that history shows us that in every regime where things have gone wrong, not just the big oppressive ones, benign dictatorships, if you like. It's, it's underground movements that have gone, look, we don't have the replacement, we just know this isn't good enough. Um, and, you know, when you see people marching against the, when we saw people marching against the Iraq war with banners saying, not in my name, I think that's identity politics. But I think uh, another way of putting that is it's standing up and being counted. And without those people deciding, this isn't me, uh, this offends me, I need to state my position, um, then we never have um, any change. And without change, as I'm sure you're aware, there's no progress, there's no marks. Okay, Nikos? What Ian mentioned about reinventing the left, I, I don't agree. I've interviewed more than 60 activists, and the, num the, the questions that they were very, very unwilling to answer was the question of what is your ideology, where do you think you stand on the ideological level? And the answer was, this doesn't matter. This is, we, this is not why we are here. And the next answer was, look around you. This is our ideology. The way we run the campus, this is our ideology. So the problem is that this, this is, and this is also the, the, the problem with prefigurative, with prefigurative politics, because it's an, in a way it's an a priori acceptance of defeat, that I cannot change things out there, I've given up on that hope, I have no narrative for out there, so I change things in here, I change my th things, it's this idea of be the change you want to see in the world, which for me is the, it's the number one idea that we need to throw out of any radical movement, and I think this was the, the, the distinctive characteristic in Occupy. There's no doubt that there are difficulties with the Occupy movement, but as a politics, if you do want to frame it as a politics of identity, I'm not entirely sure I'm comfortable with doing that actually, but even if we were, it had some very real differences that marked it out. One, it was, had a real focus on what is this thing called democracy and how can we do it better. Now that to me, having researched many protest movements over the years, was a, mar a marked difference. How are we doing it? How are we talking to each other as a group? How do we function democratically? And how can we roll that out into the broader community? Now that was really different and that did hit home in many other, yes, political organizations, but other shapes and forms around the country. I was going to lots of groups, not in London, around the country, and they were all talking about this thing. How can we change democracy so it better functions? The other thing it did, Really importantly was it put capitalism and a critique of capitalism back at the center of left politics. Now that was, you know, that had actually been missing for quite some time. And that has had, I think, quite, you know, that's had quite a lot of discussion and talk and it's enabled us again to critique, to try and begin to pull apart how this, what is this thing called capitalism and how, do we want it? Do we want it to work better? Do we want to fix it? Or do we want something entirely different? It's actually brought that question back. That has to be positive. Okay, Brendan. I think in terms of whether it represented any kind of public mood, I think what it really represented was um, the media classes. And I was always struck by how much the Occupy movement was driven by the media. I mean, throughout modern history, lots of protest movements have sought to use the media to get their argument across. What happened here is that the media used the protest movement to get its frustrations across. So it's quite notable that Occupy was started by ad busters and kind of magazine driven by these kind of snobby anti-capitalists. And you know, you had articles in The Guardian which explicitly said to Occupy, resist the demands that you should clarify your arguments. It's good that you keep yourselves quite vague. And you basically had this attempt by the media to mould Occupy so that it would suit its own agenda. So I think what Occupy really demonstrated was the influence of the media class today to the extent that they can now shape a modern protest movement and define it and tell us what it's about. So it didn't represent a mass movement at all. It represented media cliques. And the other thing I thought was very striking about it was just the luxuriant time frame that all these people were working to. I remember when I used to go on demonstrations in the early 1990s, 
we always said the same thing. You'd say, what do you want? And then you'd shout out what you wanted. And then they'd say, when do you want it? And you'd say, now. And that was it. It was always about now. And the reason it was about now is because you actually genuinely wanted to change something in society. And also because you had a life to lead and you wanted that life to be better than it was prior to the demonstration. What you have with the Occupy movement is just no sense of urgency, no sense of now whatsoever. Just, in fact, they measure their success by how long their Occupy movement lasts, by how long they can drag it out, which I think reflects two things. Firstly, it reflects that these people generally do come from classes in society that have lots of time on their hands, students, the middle classes, people who don't have actual things to do. The unemployed. Secondly, yeah, and the unemployed, yeah, exactly. And secondly... Uh, more importantly, that they don't actually have a goal to fight towards, so they can just sit back, chill out, eat their organic fruit in St. Paul's for six months, sneering at everyone else who walks past, and call it a protest movement. But it wasn't. It was just an expression of their own individual frustrations with no uh, arguments for how those might be overcome. Okay. Ian, do you want to... I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with Natalie earlier who was saying, you know, actually we did get some really good media coverage, but at the same time we, we shouldn't just talk about Occupy through the lens of the media. And as somebody involved in the movement, I, I appreciated the ability of Occupy to learn from its mistakes. And, you know, Occupy is, is both a tactic as well as a movement. So clearly being at St Paul's was about occupying a space, getting in the way and being heard. And I think, I think a lot of us um, were quite relieved when it came to an end in, in, in one respect because it was a drain on our resources in the end, you know, sort of physically, mentally. Um, but Occupy isn't just being o occupying public spaces. Um, I think what's interesting is, is the it is the community that has developed and, and prospered afterwards. And, you know, Occupy wasn't just something that happened in London. It's something ongoing in Bristol, in Lancaster, in Leeds, in Manchester. And people are um, working out new ways of organising. So something that's um, growing in popularity is this, this idea of organising in things called Occupy Circles, which is sort of reclaiming the um, the sort of intimacy of the, the sort of um, political relationships we had at St. Paul's, but bringing them back to our, our, own uh, our own communities and engaging with our own communities on issues that are affecting us. Of course, none of this is covered by the mainstream media. You know, n most people, unless they have direct contact with the movement at this stage of the game, won't have heard of this sort of grassroots level of organising. But, you know, I, I sometimes doubt when people say it was simply sort of, you know, liberal guardian readers or whatever involved, because it genuinely wasn't my experience. And everyone I speak to who went down there got a sense of the diversity, got a sense of the dissolution, disillusionment and the, the consensus around issues. Um, and I think, I think we will need to mature as a movement. You know, I do recognise, actually, that people do need to reach a stage where we can start making specific demands for things. But actually, as I said earlier, I think we need to be aware of the limitations of Occupy. Maybe Occupy can't make demands, but Occupy can... Um, bring people into a form of political engagement so that they can go on to participate in specific campaigns around specific demands. And I've seen that happen so many times with people that I'm convinced that that, will, that, that is something that will continue to prosper. One thing I'm really glad for is that uh, quite quickly Occupy gave up this image of an anti-capitalist movement because I think that anti-capitalism is such a serious case to leave it to Occupy. And what do I mean with this? It was a very very shallow anti-capitalist because, number one, it challenged, it challenged capitalism for the wrong reasons, like it, it's, it makes us greedy, it, it gives us too much or whatever. And the most important thing, it, it didn't give an inspiring alternative to capitalism. I think that what we need in the left is something that will draw people to our cause, and Occupy was not something like that. It wasn't appealing, uh, it didn't I don't think that the masses in the in, in UK were like, oh, I wish I was there, because it was a very dif difficult and elitist kind of activism. And most importantly, um, for example, why Soviet Union, for good or bad reasons, had such an appeal at some point? Because it took money in the space. Uh, Occupy not only didn't even have, didn't even come close to, 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 to giving such a vision about future and about a, a better world. 
A couple of very quick points. It's taken as axiomatic that this is a movement of the left, and I'm not sure that's entirely right. Of course, a lot of the most vocal were on the left, but it seems to me that what we're staring at here is a failure of neoliberal free market capitalism, and there are plenty of people uh, on the right that want that fixed as well. Um, it, and it would be very good if we could form a more broad-based coalition with people of all parties that see that it's simply not good enough, as somebody described it once to me in the city, that the purpose of the stock exchange is to transfer the earnings of the poor into the pockets of the rich once in every generation, which seems to have very successfully been achieved since 2008. Um, the second point I'd make is the media are being talked about sneeringly here, as if, they're not, as, as if that's something separate, planet media, which is manipulating us. Well... You know, of course, there's a certain amount of manipulation, but there's manipulation in politics, too. The media is us. Uh, uh, you know, as I speak as an ex-journalist, and I hope you can see that I'm vaguely humanoid. Um, and, you know, it would be nice to think in terms of the fact that we, we are the media. You can't just judge this on the here and now, on the immediate, actually. This is a moment in a much longer political history of the transformation or the changes within a capitalist framework. And I think it's notable moment because of the crisis that we're in and because uh, the, the, it, there has been actually precious little response against it that, that is meaningful. Occupy stood out because it was meaningful at a certain level. Yes, there's all sorts of problems with it. I don't know how it will move forward. I do think it has a legacy, and I do think that it did show at a certain point that democracy isn't working, because if it was working, we wouldn't necessarily be in the position we're in now. Yet there are very, very many difficulties, but I think we would be very foolish to write it off. It seems to be completely wrong to talk about a Occupy as a movement, mass or otherwise, much more accurate to talk about an Occupy phenomenon. Because it's not a movement, it's a relatively small group of people, time-rich, self-righteous individuals who don't really have any kind of organic links with society. In most other circumstances, they'd be ignored or pushed aside by the police. I think it was a phenomenon, it became a big public discussion, certainly, as Brendan suggested, because it was indulged by the media to an incredible extent. And also, you need to remember that the political elites across the Western world kept on saying how they really loved what Occupy stood for. They might disagree with their tactics and the particular things they did, but politician after politician, from Barack Obama, Republican politicians in uh, America, Angela Merkel, politicians in this country, kept on saying, yeah, we really, really agree with what they're saying about the city and unfairness and greed and inequality. And they, they, they promoted them because it was very useful to have people like that promoting those kind of completely backward ideas, which promoted a very kind of shallow, narrow critique of capitalism, blaming a few greedy people for broader social problems. I, mean, I think it is important to remember that mass movements, political movements, take time, and Occupy may or may not turn into something else at some point. But I, I, I think Brendan's suggestion about the importance of urgency is also very important. And to the extent that it didn't have it, and the Occupy movement really didn't have it, I think in a way it encouraged and displayed a kind of political nihilism that was very counterproductive. I mean, I, I think for a, a movement like that to have an impact, it has to convey a sense of urgency. It has to be saying, this is what we want, we want it now, this is how we're going to get it, this is what you need to do to see that we can get it. And I think it's instructive to compare Occupy, at least in the States, to the Tea Party movement, which had a very sharp electoral focus, and in a fairly short period of time had political influence and electoral influence really quite disproportionate to its numbers. The people in the Tea Party movement at the grassroots educated themselves or were already educated about sort of local political electoral processes and have had a lot of impact. You know, they have a lot of whacked out ideas, political ideas, and they carry around a lot of myths, which 
I think are quite dangerous, but it's, it's an instructive comparison. Uh, Occupy had yeah. no electoral strategy, no real political strategy, and as a result, they've had, in, at least in the States, no political impact. A movement that um, claims to be radical is actually complaining about bad media coverage. I mean, what would you expect um, from a radical movement that wants to change uh, uh, dramatically? I mean, you would expect to have a negative uh, uh, media coverage, and I would become very skeptical uh, if I wouldn't get a, a, a negative media coverage. But I think what it also shows is that um, Occupy, for me, appears to be, uh, appear to be very outward oriented. I mean, it was a mu much about outlook and how they came across. So, and they weren't at all focused on content, but on form and, uh, and uh, fetishizing form and outlook while neglecting content. And in a sense, as they were like this, they actually reflect a kind of politics that we have these days, like form fetishists um, neglecting content. I mean, we've got enough people of that sort in government. We don't need an opposition movement for that. Do you think as an Occupy movement you've achieved anything, first of all, because it seems to me that if you haven't got an agenda, then it's very hard to judge yourself as successful or unsuccessful because there isn't anything to achieve. Um, secondly, what have you taught the left? Because you said that you, as the Occupy movement, you showed new ta tactics. Uh, as a person on the left, I feel like I've learned only that pumping doesn't really do anything. And I, I, yeah, you know, with strikes, trade unions and things like that, they actually have achieved something. So, yeah, first question is, what have you achieved? Second question is, what the left could learn from you? Just answering the, the point over there, you know, about sort of, um, you know, like Obama or Hillary Clinton saying something positive about Occupy, and therefore that means that we're not a radical movement. Well, you know, Obama and Hillary Clinton say plenty about supporting do democracy in the Middle East. That doesn't make those grassroots campaigners genuinely demanding democracy wrong. You know, the, the message is right. The motives are different from, from the two different parties. On the, on the issue of media coverage, I didn't complain about the media coverage. I think, I think Occupy was very aware of the, the limits of, of, of the media, which is why one of the very positive things that came out of Occupy was new media run and organized and written by uh, grassroots activists. And we've, you know, uh, Quite, quite diverse media as well. So we've seen things like the Occupy Times, the Occupy News Networks, covering our own stories in, through, through our own lens. Um, and this has been a really powerful way of communicating with people. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen this elsewhere. We've seen this thing through things like ZNet and whatever, and um, hopefully we will see more of it. I, th I think um, one of the things that Occupy really sort of solved for me personally, and I, th and I think other occupiers would agree with this, is the, there was a sense of sort of political frustration and sort of shouting at the TV screen, shouting at the newspapers and saying, you know, something is wrong here, what do I do about it? And as someone who didn't come from a sort of leftist ba background or didn't have that political education at university through the sort of traditional roots, um, through Occupy, I have made connections with the left. So it's, it's not so much that I, I, I think the, you know, the sort of traditional leftist organi or, you know, the organizations are wrong. It's more that I think Occupy has been a conduit for people to discuss and become aware of those forms of organization. Because I think a lot of people are put off by the, the, old, the old language of, you know, sort of, no, no matter how appealing, you know, like Marxism is to me personally, or anarchism, or these, these are words, anti-capitalism is another one. These are words that are largely off-putting to people, even if um, the ideology, if, pe you know, if people sort of knew about some of these ideas, was appealing when, you know, once, they, once they'd learnt about them. So I, I think Occupy was about using new language, communicating people who didn't want to go to sort of, you know, weekly fortnightly uh, meetings with four speakers at the front telling them that we should overthrow capitalism. You know, I just think this, this message is lost on a lot of people, even if it becomes very appealing later, later on through, through the process of being involved in, in Occupy. Maybe it's because I'm from the Church of England that I'm used to uh, finding things 
good that everybody else thinks are bad things, because earlier on I sort of went, hallelujah, it's identity politics and, uh, and a piece of theater. And then the woman at the back there says it's, you know, political, it smells of political nihilism. Well, again, I say, well, hooray. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that political nihilism is necessarily a negative under these circumstances. I'll tell you what happens if you start saying, well, no, you know, if you, if, if really you start playing the game like other people play it, like other, other, like politicians are playing it, then you end up, and this is the territory that I know about, you end up with uh, what Ian refers to at St. Paul's Cathedral, debates held by city people under the auspices of the Corporation of the City of London that are pretending to move the debate forward. No, you know, when people are fed up with a system, they need to take direct action. And, uh, and now really, I mean, you know, that's just to pick up on something there that Natalie was saying, you know, about democracy not working, possibly. Well, democracy always works. It's like saying uh, love doesn't work. You know, democracy is an absolute. Um, it always works if it's being done right. If it's not working, it isn't democracy. Okay, Nikos? So is it too soon to judge Occupy movement? My answer is no, because it's not something that came out of nowhere. It's a continuation of previous movements, such as the anti-globalization movement, or in this country, the anti-roads camps, the climate camps. And the problem is that each of these movements, when it is facing a dead end, which all these dead ends are, have one common element, which is the lack of politics and the lack of a specific object, then it reappears in a different form, and it, it kind of masks this as a positive thing. It reminds me the days in the Communist Party when, when the strike was over, the, the line was, okay, comrades, we go back home, but then we'll come back stronger. And, we, you know, that made us happy. But this is not something to, to be celebrated. And another thing is, I think that George, from his point of view, is right. And, I mean, as a moral movement and as a moralistic gesture, Occupy was fantastic. But the problem is for people who are not in the church and for people who, who, who's, who's, whose ambition is not like moral rehabilitation, but whose ambition is to change the world, as should be the ambition in the left, this is something which needs to worry us. In relation to the question, is it a mass movement or will it become a mass movement, I think it's an anti-mass movement in the sense that it was not only because it was small, um, but it was anti-masses. It just had, you know, most of the Occupy movement's propaganda was just contemptible of mass society. If you look at the website of Occupy Wall Street, there's all this stuff about ordinary Americans being brainwashed by Fox News and becoming super religious and being brainwashed to think that capitalism is the only thing you could ever live under. Uh, the Occupy movement at St. Paul's had these posters up describing um, people who worked in the city as chumps or tarts, you know, basically just looking with real contempt amongst the, uh, on, on anyone who inhabits mass society. And then also think about the extraordinary privileges that were enjoyed by the Occupy movement. You know, not only did they have the support of the media, the vast majority of the media, they also had the support of the church, they also had the support of uh, large sections of the political class, and they had the support of the police. This is the first movement, in, the first radical protest movement in history that wasn't beaten up by the police, but in fact was protected by the police. So there was a moment when the Occupy St. Paul movement was apparently going to be threatened by the English Defence League, the kind of right-wing group. So on the basis of loads of rumours, the police went to a pub where the English Defence League were meeting and arrested them all and put them in jail to protect the Occupy movement from possibly having to argue or scuffle with other people. So this is the first time in history that, in fact, the police have gone out of their way not to beat up protesters, but to protect them from other people. So every single wing of the state uh, supported this movement, largely speaking, apart from a few, you know, people will quote articles from the Daily Mail because that's all they've got to show that, you know, the state apparently hated it. And I think the reason why yeah, it enjoyed these, th this support and these privileges and this kind of state protection that is normally only given to members of the royal family is because... It, it says things which fit in very nicely with the modern political mainstream outlook, which is that it's anti-growth, it's about restraint, it's about reining things in, it's about slowing society down, all of which adds a kind of radical gloss to the sluggishness of modern capitalism. It, adds a kind, it makes uh, the sluggishness of modern capitalism look acceptable and sexy. It kind of adds to that idea that society should just be shrunken and made more timid and made more, you know, quiet and, and slow and everything else. So 
I think the, Occupy had nothing to do with the left, as I understand the left. It was not about unleashing people's potential or realizing human potential or creating more. It was about reining things in and slowing things down. So it doesn't represent a rehabilitation of the left in any sense. It represents the death of the left. And I think now anyone who wants to change society needs to look beyond the left, which is just over. It's finished. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, just very quickly, Brendan, there's something that's just plain wrong. If Occupy had the support of the church, I'd hate to see a movement that the church opposed, because that would be really, really, really grim. But the other thing, too, is that you call it small. Um, how many hits a day does Spike get, and how many hits a day do you think Occupy were getting at the height of it last year? Okay, Natalie? There was a sense in which it was, and there were very many complex political reasons for it. People chose to say, yes, all right, let's let them have their say, because actually it's far easier to do that. It gives a veneer, an illusion of democracy in action, that we're letting these people talk, we're letting them protest, we're letting them have their say, we'll give them a voice, therefore aren't we wonderful and democratic, without actually really taking account of anything that was going on. But I wanted to come back to a point that somebody said that they were fetishizing form. I think, again, I think that actually thinking very hard about how we organize society is a very good thing. And if we are fetishizing form to do that, which is precisely what Occupy were trying to do, they were trying to say, what is it? How can we better come together, understand each other's voices, and then organize ourselves? Yes, it was very small, and it was very kind of exclusive in all sorts of ways, but it was an attempt to think about new ways of production and redistribution that was actually, you know, I, I thought, very creative, very imaginative, and the first time in many years where that's, that has really um, gained momentum and got a bit of credibility. There was an article in the Standard sometime this spring with Kai Wargela and several other Occupy leaders and very glossy colour photos, you know, very lifestyle profiles of them. And they were talking about how much disruption they were going to cause during the Olympics. We've got plans, we're going to do X, we're going to do this. Why were they doing that? Are they really that stupid? Have they got no sense of tactical awareness? Are they not aware of infiltration? Are they not aware of a factor of surprise? Or are they simply so spellbound by getting a media profile, but they can't help themselves. And this is more a question for Ian as well. What are you doing to train people in tactical awareness and awareness of infiltration and the factor of surprise? For me, one of the interesting aspects of the Occupy movement, particularly in America, was the keynote phrase, the 1% and the 99%. Um, and I think that this is where the political awareness of uh, otherwise rather vague uh, Occupy movement is focused and very importantly so because I think they're beginning to reflect a growing awareness that our problems cannot be um, couched in uh, conventional political terms, right wing, left wing, socialism and the rest of it, that what underlies the problem is a moral problem and a psychological problem, that there will always be embedded in humanity 1% or not 0.1% of people who are faster, smarter, more detached, more resilient, <laughs> and just simply cleverer and care less than the rest of us. And they will always corner the market, whatever system is in place. They will always yeah. um, outsmart yeah. attempts to regulate them. Uh, they're just faster think, than the rest yeah, of us. I think you've made and point. they force us to play their game. But we don't want to play that game, and the Occupy movement is all about that. Now, I'd be interested to, uh, for members of the panel to uh, give us an update, okay. if you like, on, on where the Occupy movement sees a solution to this problem, which is not really a political okay. problem. The discussion about forms of, sort of communication that were taking place um, and the way people communicated sort of reminded me when I used to work for a, a social work department and they were going to make swathing cuts. And the main things that the union organizers would, would come back and say is that, yeah, they're going to make swathing cuts. I really don't like the way they've communicated this with us. 
And I thought, well, that's peculiar because I don't give a toss how they've communicated this with us. I want to know how we're going to fight the cuts. And it seemed to be this fetish with communication seemed to be because they'd actually given up on fighting for jobs. So I don't know if this is relevant, but it seems peculiar. The other thing is I just wanted to know how many people in the Occupy movement had knocked on any doors. I say this slightly with resentment because I was in a left-wing group for many, many years and I would sell newspapers on a Saturday, on a Monday, on a Tuesday. I would go around White City and knock on doors. I would try and mobilize people for meetings, for demonstrations. I would have the police uh, intimidate while I'm putting up posters. So I did all this. And the reason that I did that is because I thought the point was that I need to reach the public. So I want to know how many doors have you knocked? OK, thank you. I, I think what's really, really important is that I, I've noticed that there's this rejection of self-criticism. I think it's really, really important for people on the left to be, to understand the, the positives of a movement, but also to be self-critical and to really reflect on yourself. And there's this desire to cheerlead and to be suspicious of anyone who raises questions. And I think that's hugely problematic. I think one of the problems is that um, there's really a lack of a positive vision for what the future can be like. For people who are facing their houses being taken away and a reduction in their standard of living, a tent city doesn't really offer very much to get involved in. I'm sorry, I look at that as a vision for the future and that really, really scares me. And you, you sort of mention that, well, the good thing is that, you know, at least, you know, these arguments about Marxism and that sort of thing, that doesn't really appeal to people. But at least, you know, it gets people involved, gets them thinking. Almost like we adopt this slow education process and then we can spring Marxism on them or something like that. But if you really want to change the world, perhaps it's, you do have to make really difficult arguments. And instead of appealing to the lowest common denominator with, yeah, yeah, everybody, everybody has a place here, maybe you, you might have to win that argument. Maybe you will have to try to understand the world in order to change it. And, and that's not going to appeal to everyone. It seems to me that the discussion of aims is a bit redundant because there was nothing quite sort of concrete enough and nothing shared by the whole movement. But I think in some ways anyone at this event should have a hard time criticising it. Because I, I visit the camp in St Paul's and the best thing about it seemed to me was the, the battle of ideas that was going on. I you know, heard issues of liberty discussed and even shockingly social justice which had become a bit of a dirty phrase. And it was very much like this because you know, it was an open, free discussion of controversial issues and it wasn't the same as other protests because it didn't have a single sort of legislative goal it was more a meeting of people that knew there was a problem and were talking about an answer. The Occupy camp in St Paul's wasn't like the battle of ideas at all I went there and uh, a number of times and they had all these r rules for discussions that you had to have a certain amount of respect you weren't allowed to raise your voice you had to shake your hands like this if you agreed with someone and do something else if you disagreed with someone. They had all these really kind of formulaic rules which were aimed at making the debates as timid as possible actually and they were not battles of ideas, they were kind of just shared agreements on, on general issues. It was, there was no substance to it at all. And in relation to the 99% and the 1% thing, I mean I think, I don't think that is a break with the old politics. I think that that comes from an old politics which is called fascism. The idea that you represent everyone in society just by virtue of the fact that you declare it, I represent 99%, you're virtually everyone, is a habit more linked to dictatorships than it is to the left as I understand the left. And it does reflect an unwillingness to engage with people and instead just to presume that you speak for them. And the reason you speak for them is because they're so stupid they can't speak for themselves. So I think the 99% thing really spoke to a slightly uncomfortable authoritarian streak within the Occupy movement. Great, Nikos. It's kind of an intellectual laziness because it signifies a lack of any will to engage in proper analysis. And the thing is that people who aspired or actually changed history like Marx, they could have easily said proletarians are 99%, that's all now I'll go and have beers with Bakunin. But actually what they did is they engaged in very, very difficult and serious and probably never ending uh, kind of a way to formulate this idea in a, in, in, in a more convincing and a more accurate way. And the other day I was in a, in a, in a, in a lecture by Gitlin, the guy who wrote the books on New Left, and he gave an example about why this 99% is, is kind of a group narcissistic idea. He said, at one point in the 60s, I was in a protest in the United States with 30 other people. We have blocked 
erode, and we're chanting, we are the people, we are the people. And there was a huge queue of like two kilometers of, of cars, like shouting, get the hell out of here, we want to go to our jobs. And this is kind of, for me, this says a lot about what happens when you get the illusion that you represent the people. Just picking up on the debating methods uh, of Occupy, I went there several times too, and I found it really refreshing. You talk about um, uh, debates in which people aren't allowed to interrupt, make ad hominem attacks, and uh, not raise their voice. Well, what are you suggesting is the ideal um, alternative? The House of Commons, I mean, and you, you speak as if, you speak not as if, you say the left is well over. Well, you sound like Francis Fukuyama, frankly, writing a book called the, the End of History. How stupid does that look now? A book that proposed that capitalism had effectively ended the march of historical conflict. Well, no. I mean, it's rather like saying dissent is over. It's in human nature to dissent uh, from a norm, from those who impose a matrix of power on us. I mean, I, you know, before I sound too smug here, I think the, I, I, I think the Church of England got a massive wake-up call uh, from Occupy, and it was really, really a godsend, and I choose my words carefully, that they ended up on the steps of St. Paul's, because it absolutely demonstrated that the Church of England, representing a faith that is meant to represent an alternative, uh, that is meant to be changing the world, uh, just recoiled on itself and, and, and buried its head. So, you know, we're, we're, we're in that sense, we're all in this together. Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to pick up the point made over there about um, why did we allow that to happen, talking about the, the, the disrupting the Olympics, um, the Olympic Games. Um, I mean, again, I, I think that sort of criti criticism comes from a sort of misunderstanding of movements in a way, because movements aren't a dictatorship. You know, we can't control every person in the movement, and that certainly wouldn't be my, my aim or anyone else. In, well, presumably some people would like to control everyone else in the movement. But, you know, there's always going to be a diversity. And I, and I think, you know, like a few people went up to... Um, Hampstead Heath and somebody said something homophobic and suddenly this was in the news that Occupy condones homophobia, you know, so I, I think this is seeing movements through a very elitist position You really have to you know like bringing movements together and I'd be interested to talk to Brendan about this because you know It's very clear that he's got lots of experience of building very successful movements um, you know, how, actually, you, you, you're working alongside people where there are disagreements, where there are difficulties, where there are people with mental health problems, all, a whole variety of things. And to build a movement, you have to, you have to embrace with that and engage in it. You can't sit on the outside and just criticize people who fall out of line. Um, I, 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 I think that I, I just Quick point. wanted to say really something. I th for me, um, I agree with you about making strong arguments, I do. But I also think there's value in, I, I, I think the very opposite of being elitist is actually inspiring people to take action based on what they already know as well. Because I think, I think people out there, as I said before, the polling data confirms this, know there's a problem with inequality. They want to see changes. And, and actually, we need to um, inspire each other to act on what we know. That's not an elitist position. That's not telling people what to do. That's, that's engagement, surely. Okay, Natalie? This was a response to a real sense of injustice. I think that was the, the basic response. We have to find ways to move beyond that. I mean, Ashley is absolutely right that we have to be self-reflexive about it. And what we, if it really is about shifting the balance of power, about gaining redistribution on some major level and limiting the power of capital in certain ways so that it is more accountable to the people, then we have to find a way of working through a political system. And that is a really crucial point. There has to be some point at which you can make the current political system that exists, listen to you, or you overthrow it. I mean, it's basically uh, as okay. simple as that. I'm uh, Vangelis Davididis, editor-in-chief of uh, Submarine Magazine from Greece. I would like to bring some uh, freshness in uh, the discussion because we had uh, also an occupying movement, as most of you know, and it was a quite massive one. So our experience from there 
uh, could be very useful to this dialogue. Uh, Occupy movement in, in Athens made pretty clear that uh, it, di it didn't want traditional left to come with the banners and say the same things as they say every time when they are protesting. You can be a part of this, but don't come here with your flags and your symbols, etc., etc. Okay. So uh, uh, the thing is that I see that traditional left is really jealous from the from the mass media promoting, let's say, uh, occupy movement. Uh, if traditional left thinks that think that they, they don't um, have to gain anything from the occupy movement, they will lose. I think that in order to have a movement, broad, a broad movement, then uh, the two sides have to learn from each other. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I just wanted to go back to Brendan's point um, about the death of the left that lots of people clap for, just because I literally didn't really understand what you meant. Um, and if you have time in your summary to just explain briefly, like what I got from it was something about people in Occupy being sluggish and that being something to do with the death of the left, which I don't really get. Like, if you don't like the tactics of certain groups on the left, that's one thing. But I just didn't get any substance from it. I just want to pick up on this one point about the fact that Occupy stands for wanting redistribution. I mean, from what you've said, what Occupy wants is redistribute wealth, whatever from the rich to the poor. Isn't that so uh, a backward step in that all we're really talking about is dividing the cake as it is? Surely, if you are really for change, then it is a question about wanting more for everybody, lifting society out of the kind of doldrums we are in. Rather, it appears like a lot of the focus is bashing the rich in order to make some of us feel perhaps better. But is, that's not what change is. Change is about wanting and having aspirations to have a better, decent society, not for just, you know, for everyone. I couldn't agree more that change is complex and you can't just put it down to single words, but this has been a kind of quick-fire debate and we're pushing forward. So I've jotted down, actually, five things that would be on my list if I was going to say, okay, what would we do? We'd end predatory foreign policy, we'd dismantle the offshore network, we'd have democratic control of central banks, we'd take action on climate change and we'd reform the national media regime. You know, if we did a start in some of those things, so we might get some progress. Now I think it's, but there are obviously hugely complex issues behind those things. What Occupy did was allow the debate to begin. I think being in favour of redistribution doesn't mean you're against growth. I, you know, I think you can still believe in growth, in, in, in creating more and more value based on human creativity and the resources that we have. Um, I think growth is often misunderstood, and maybe it's misunderstood in Occupy, so I'll certainly take that on board. But when, 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 when the economy has been growing and a large number of people's salaries in real terms have been falling, then that's a problem of how we distribute growing resources. That's not, that's not being anti-growth. Um, so um, I, I, I just wanted to say something finally about, you know, sort of specific demands. I think, I think we do need to move to specific demands. I suspect when we do, and it might not be something that Occupy is capable of, but I suspect when we will do, we will be accused of being very conservative. You know, so defending the NHS, oh, that's conservative. Defending free education, that's conservative. Um, but actually, these, are th these small differences have enormous uh, consequences on people's lives. Um, defending disability benefits, you know, being a classic example at the moment. Um, and and I, I think the key to win it, when we win these demands, and I hope that we do, um, you know, these will energize our movement and, you know, we, we can move forward, forward as a radical movement. I don't think winning short-term gains is, is a, a conservative thing at all. I don't object to people being rich. I object to rich people stealing my money. Um, and uh, that, I think, is much of what we're examining uh, here and m much of the resentment and anger that's been, um, uh, that's been exhibited. Um, I'd like to just finish with a question. I mean, if Occupy weren't doing it, who would be? You know, I haven't actually, I'm just, I'm frankly surprised that more people haven't taken to the streets an objection to what's happened since 2008. Um, 
And in that context, I would think that Occupy, amongst many of the questions it's raising, is one that's very close to my heart, uh, which is rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. In Greece, we had, on Occupy here, you had on maximum maybe 300 people in the squares. In Greece, there were days we had half a million. And I was there, it was, felt good, it was fantastic. The problem is at the end it didn't work, but we learned from our mistakes. We understood that we need to take a step further. We, we thought that this would be bring the, uh, building a political project. Okay, maybe Syriza was not exactly what we would expect, but we'll, we'll, we'll do even better, hopefully. But on that question about uh, the state of the left and where does the Occupy lead us, I think the first thing we need to do in the left is not do things even worse than they are now and not make le left even more appealing, less appealing than it is now. So the first thing to do is not to jump and embrace various trends as we've done in the past, like parts of the environmental movement or the identity politics movement, or at least not to do it uncritically, and then maybe we can think how we can, where we can go on from there. So, last point, I don't think it would be a good idea for left to embrace Occupy or have things to do with it. In terms of what I mean by the death of the left, I just think that the modern left has ditched all of the insights of socialism, the three great insights of socialism. Number one, they used to argue that the problems facing society were social rather than natural. The left has abandoned that through its embrace of environmentalism. Number two, the left was pro-growth. It was absolutely in favor of more production. That's been abandoned in, in the anti-growth left, which thinks that growth makes us mentally ill and destroys the planet and so on. And thirdly, the left used to argue that people were capable of running their own lives and determining their destinies without needing the state or kings or armies to help them. The modern left is utterly pro-state and thinks people aren't capable of running their lives without the welfare state and everything else. So the left has ditched all its principles it's dead. I don't think it's the end of history. I don't think history has even begun properly yet. But what I know is that we won't be able to make history if we continue dressing up in the garb of the old dead left and have these kind of night of the living dead movements that the Occupy movement represented. Thank you. Can we have a thanks to our speakers, please?